This video was brought to you by the Cove Commuter 2 Portable Bluetooth Speaker. High quality sounds with an innovative design and affordable price. Hello friends, my name is JJ. So big news was made here in Canada last week and for once it didn't have anything to do with truckers or Justin Trudeau. No, it had to do with Disney releasing a movie that takes place in Canada. So as I'm sure is the case in most countries, few things delight the patriotic Canadian middle class more than being acknowledged by Hollywood. I remember when I was a kid, the fact that the 1999 South Park movie had a substantial Canadian subplot was considered the most exhilarating thing in the world, even though Canada wasn't really depicted in the most flattering light, and I would argue most Canadians didn't fully realize the degree that the joke was on them. A few years after that, we got the Scott Pilgrim film, which was a movie adaptation of a graphic novel written by a young Canadian cartoonist that took place in modern day Toronto. Other than its setting, however, the film didn't really engage with Canadian themes to any substantial degree, just as the books didn't. But people were still tickled by it anyway, because, you know, acknowledgement. And now we have Turning Red, a picture written and directed by Domi Shi, who was born in China but immigrated to Canada with her parents as a baby. The film is loosely based on her own life and like Scott Pilgrim also takes place in Toronto and thus has been treated as a very big deal indeed by Canada's reliably nationalistic press. And that being the case, as your beloved Canadian cultural correspondent, I feel like it would be a dereliction of duty if I did not at least offer a bit of my own unique brand of analysis of this film. You know, getting into what, if anything, it says about Canada, how it's been perceived in Canada, and deconstruct any Canadian in-jokes or references it might contain. So Turning Red is an animated film released by Pixar, a studio that, as we all know, has become synonymous with the very highest quality of Disney animation. There has been some discussion as to whether or not this film completely lives up to that lofty reputation, in large part because of its theme and setting. While Pixar's most iconic films have all been set in worlds very different than our own, featuring fantastical characters like monsters or robots or talking cars, Turning Red is set in the comparatively less ambitious and exotic world of what is basically just modern middle-class America. I guess I should just quickly summarize the plot of the film before we get into some deeper analysis. May is a very precocious 13-year-old girl living in Toronto. She comes from a multi-generational Chinese-Canadian family who still maintain ties to their old world culture by owning and operating a shrine to their ancestors that functions as something of a tourist attraction. Then one day, May turns into a giant red panda. Initially, and frankly with a bluntness that I found surprising for a Disney film, the the movie seems to be going down the road of treating this as a metaphor for her first period. Hey, hey. <laughs> Is everything okay? Don't come in here! Hey, hey. What's going on, honey? Are you sick? Is it a fever? A stomachache? Chills? Constipation? No. Wait. Is it that? Did the did the red peony bloom? But it's quickly established that no, this is just a weird curse that May's family's ancestors have placed on all of their female descendants. It's possible to break the curse, but only if May keeps her panda transformations in check which get triggered whenever she gets really riled up by something. One thing I liked about this film is that it resists the temptation to just make the central drama May's constant efforts to hide her transformations from everyone, which I think is a kind of stale premise for kids' movies of this sort. Instead, much of the plot involves May having to resist the temptation to transform in public too much after she and her girlfriends realize her transformations can be a good way to raise money to attend this boy band concert that they really want to see. The film has a relatively weak climax, in my opinion, which, without spoiling too much, let's just say, leans very heavily into doubling down on the mystical, magical side of the panda lore in order to provide a excuse for a lot of epic fight sequences and so forth. A review I quite agreed with was this one by Adam White in The Independent, where he closes by saying, In its earliest stages, Turning Red is bracingly different and filled with an earnest warmth when it comes to themes of girlhood and the panic-inducing weirdness of the human body. That it becomes a loud and action-driven spectacle seems disappointingly inevitable for a Disney film. Okay, so that being the basic gist, let us now talk about how the movie has been received so far. I don't want to pretend like 
like it's been controversial because that would really be overstating it, but there certainly has been some discourse around the film. And while reviews have been broadly favorable, there has been a bit of criticism too. And much of it involves the movie's context and setting. Obviously, given the times we live in, there has been a lot of talk about the film's depiction of the Asian family at the heart of the story, who are probably never going to be depicted to everyone's satisfaction. May's mother is a sort of traditional tiger mom type, and this fact, coupled with the whole Chinese mysticism angle, has led some, like New York Times critic Maya Phillips, to accuse the film of featuring a kid-friendly version of exoticism. The fact that the story of Turning Red is so heavily influenced by director Domi Shi's own very particular life experiences has likewise led other critics to accuse the film of being too in-jokey and alienating. A guy called Sean O'Connell wrote what has now become a rather notorious 2.5 star review of the movie for Cinema Blend, in which he said that, By rooting Turning Red very specifically in the Asian community of Toronto, the film legitimately feels like it was made for Domi Shi's friends and immediate family members. Which is fine, but also a tad limiting in its scope. Now, I cannot speak to the Asian side of the movie, but I can speak to the Canadian side. In fact, I'm actually in a pretty good place to analyze it, and not just because I'm Canadian. You see, though the film is not too overt about it, Turning Red is actually supposed to be a period piece taking place in the ancient year of 2002. This was when Domi Shi was a teenager, and I was as well, because we are roughly the same age. Well, she is actually a few years younger than me, which is never a fact I enjoy learning about highly successful people. Anyway, Turning Red doesn't put the fact that it takes place 20 years ago too in your face. Some of the characters use dated technology, and the boy band that the girls like has a very early 2000s aesthetic to it, but that's about it. The film's overall look is very cartoonish and stylized, and doesn't and try very hard to evoke much in the way of nostalgia for things like early 21st century fashion or pop culture. On the other hand, the film really, really wants you to know that it takes place in Toronto. The characters mention living in Toronto constantly, and the CN Tower, Toronto's most famous landmark, appears in the background what I can only describe as a gratuitous amount of times. There are references to the Toronto public transit system and specific real-world Toronto places. This one character wears what is clearly supposed to be a Toronto Raptors jersey, and so on. In terms of references to Canada more broadly, however, the film is a lot weaker. The Canadian flag and maple leaf show up a lot, and there are a few shout-outs to popular cliches, like how the family has a bobblehead moose on the car dashboard, and how May calls some kids hosers at one point. You want to bring up the hosers? I'm telling your mother! which is a very old-fashioned sort of Canadian slang. But overall, I gotta say, I was expecting a lot more in-jokes, given that Pixar films are usually really into this kind of thing. I even re-watched the movie a second time to freeze-frame all of the scenes where there's a lot of junk in the background, like when they're at school or the store, where you think they might have crammed in a bunch of funny stuff, but... There was surprisingly little. Like, none of these brands of products are parodies of famous Canadian ones, for instance, which is kind of disappointing. They didn't even give them bilingual packaging. Though, I will note that in this scene, the store has an ad in the window that says, all the refreshing flavor of milk in one frothy bag, in reference to the infamous Ontario practice of selling milk in plastic bags. But that said, it's not like the film contains no interesting Canadian in-jokes at all, so allow me to provide you with a quick rundown. Did you know that in Turning Red, the four concert is presented in conjunction with something called View. This is a parody of the Canadian music channel Much Music, Canada's answer to MTV. In several scenes, the characters are depicted eating boxes of Timbit donut holes from Tim Hortons, the iconic Canadian fast food chain. The name of the school the kids attend is Lester B. Pearson Middle School. Lester B. Pearson was the Prime Minister of Canada from 1963 to 1968. The school also has a sign out front calling attention to Canadian Indigenous Peoples History Month. This is an anachronism as Canadian Indigenous Peoples History Month wasn't a thing until 2009. The paper money the characters use is depicted accurately based on the design of Canadian currency at the time. Spring of 2002 saw the debut of a new Canadian $5 bill that kids back then were really excited to use. There are also a few interesting subtle references to some of the ways that ethnic diversity manifests in modern Canada. The main antagonist in the film is a black kid called Tyler. When we later briefly meet his parents, we see that the father has some sort of foreign accent. All right, party's over. Everyone go home. 
Canada. This is a nod to the fact that the vast majority of black people in Canada are either immigrants or their children. So just a good little bit of attention to detail. The school security guard, meanwhile, is depicted as an Indian man in a turban. Immigrants from India's Punjab province tend to be overrepresented in certain blue collar Canadian jobs with low ranking security guards for places like malls or construction sites being particularly common. There was some controversy in Canada about this character being a bit of an ethnic stereotype, but in this interview with Maclean's magazine, Domi Shi claims that the character was actually supposed to be based on a guy called Baltage Dillon, who was the first member of the Canadian Mounties who was allowed to wear a turban instead of the traditional hat. That strikes me as a bit of a stretch, but I guess either way, the character is a revealing inclusion. Talking of racial stuff, while this film is generally devoid of politics or commentary on specifically Canadian social issues at all, if it wants you to think one thing about Canada, it's this idea of Canada as a kind of multicultural utopia. The Toronto this film depicts is presented as a very idyllic sort of place where the sun is always shining and children of every race and color get along without even the faintest whiff of racism or tension. Which is all well and good until you remember that this colorblind feel-good frolic is quite specifically supposed to take place just a few months after 9-11. For a film set in such an ultra specific time, it is a bit curious that this was the time that was chosen. But that gets to one of the big questions of this film that I and other critics have asked, which is whether Turning Red's hyper particular setting provides any real use to the film's plot or theme, or as Sean O'Connell wrote in his infamous review, if it's just sentimentality for its own sake and the sake of the Creator. Overall, I don't think it's a bad film, though it's certainly far from Pixar's best. I think some of the depictions of teenagehood are incredibly relatable, even if you're not a Asian girl from Toronto. But that said, as someone with a lot of interest in Canadian stuff and knowing just how rare it is for Hollywood to make a movie about Canada, I would have liked to see a film that perhaps engaged with its Canadianness a little bit more substantially or even superficially rather than merely using Canada as a kind of stand-in for the sort of generically pleasant, child-friendly urban setting that a lot of kids' entertainment tends to take place in. I will concede, though, that Canada is a difficult place to use as a setting, given that most of Canadian reality is defined by how identical it is to the United States. This means that the only real way to make a more overtly Canadian film is to either lean extremely heavily into Canadian material culture, you know, brands and stuff, which can get pretty trite, or to focus on things like Canadian history and politics and social issues, which might not be appropriate for a lot of movies, especially a kid's movie. So, does Turning Red deserve the giddy reputation it's been receiving from the Canadian press? On the one hand, I think that some of the delight is probably a bit unwarranted, given that the film engages with its Canadianness in a way that is probably too subtle to really provoke that much fascination or curiosity from international audiences. On the other hand, depicting Canadianness as something subtle and easily ignored might actually be the most accurate Canadian depiction of all. So today's video was brought to you by Cove, makers of fine audio electronics like this thing, the Cove brand Commuter 2 Bluetooth speaker. Now, I live in an incredibly small apartment, which means that I am always looking for gimmicky solutions to make the most of my tiny space. And when I was watching Turning Red on my laptop, I was able to use this speaker to create my poor man's saroon sound, because check out what it can do. Eh? Eh? So I was able to put each half behind me, and it worked perfectly. The Bluetooth connectivity worked really well, which is always my biggest concern, and the powerful subwoofers deliver a really high quality sound. See, like this. They can hold a charge for up to seven hours, function up to 32 feet away from your device, and even have mild water protection if you are one of those people who likes to listen to music in the shower, as I am. Anyway, the Cove folks are selling these things in a wide variety of attractive colors, and if you purchase yours using either the JJ McCullough promo code or by clicking on the link in the thing below, you can get quite a substantial discount at the checkout. If you're someone like me that is trying to make the most of a small space 
or merely looking for a versatile and affordable portable speaker option, why not give the Cove Commuter 2 a try today? So a while ago, I made a not terribly popular video about a movie that I consider to be one of the most Canadian films ever made, a picture called The 20th Century that barely made it out of the art house theater circuit. Turning Red is a much more enjoyable and dare I say better film, but comparing these two very different movies did get me wondering about the substantial distinction between a film that is set in a place versus a film that is about a place. Can you think of some other good examples of films that have a very particular setting in terms of location and time, but also don't really use that setting to add much to the film's plot or theme? I am frankly not a person that watches a lot of movies, so I'm a little bit curious as to just how common this is as a movie phenomenon and therefore how fair or unfair it is to criticize a movie like Turning Red for not doing enough with its setting. Let me know in the comments below, and I will see you all next week. Oh, oh.